They are two of the Tennessee attorneys who went to the U.S. Supreme Court in the historic battle for marriage equality. In their new book, The Fight for Marriage, Church Conflicts and Courtroom Contest, they describe the legal and church history of marriage, as well as the personal, spiritual, and legal milestones that led to marriage equality for everyone. We welcome Bill Harbison and Phil Kramer. First off, I just have to say a, a huge thanks to both of you for what you did for oh. so many people in our community. Thank you. I, Absolutely. Thank I mean, you, but in retrospect, I mean, it's we who are thankful because we got to ex go through this experience and, y y you know, y this is something you dream of to be part of in law school and, and uh, you know, so what we took out of it, I, I think, is a as much as anyone else. Well, it it's huge. So much to talk about. I mean, get right to it. I also wanted to point out, you guys live here in Nashville. You go to Belmont United Methodist Church, and we'll get to why that's important a little bit later on in the interview. But I wanted to start this with, uh, it's been said, and your book echoes it, that marriage equality is the most contentious civil rights dispute of the 21st century. So that's a pretty heavy load to take to court. So yeah. how did you approach that? Phil? <laughs> well, you know, it, it really came down when we were in D.C. preparing for, you know, the week before the argument, and we're at Howard Law School, and they are doing a moot court uh, in preparation. And the, the, the director of the program comes out and says, you know, we, we moot sort of marquee civil rights cases. Uh, we mooted Brown v. Board of Education, and we see this as being comparable to that. Uh, to, to me, that weight, but yet the opportunity uh, we're both commensurate. That, sure. that, that brought it home, but you know, when you file any lawsuit, you don't know it's going to be the case that goes to the United States Supreme Court. You just know you're trying to get a result for the client in that case. And so it built over time the momentum and the importance of it. Well, and I'm sure when, when, it, when it came down in 2015, granting marriage equality, I'm sure you were elated. But did you have any idea of the long road still to go on this issue? <sighs> Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, you take a, you take a pause, you, you celebrate the, the, the victory, but then you realize, you know, from 1865 to 1954, and then from 1954, which is Brown v. Board, into the late 60s, you know, th th these things, unfortunately, don't change overnight, and you can change the laws, but it's really changing the hearts and minds. That and that, that's the, what we still got to do. Now, I mentioned earlier that you were members of Belmont United Methodist Church here mm -hmm. in Nashville, and that plays a big part in the story overall. So let me read something from your book, and we'll go from there. Now, quote, this book is not meant to be a history of the struggle for marriage equality within the United Methodist Church or any other church, nor is it meant to be an exhausting history of the legal case for marriage equality. The stories we experience are, however, part of that larger story, and we happen to be two of the lawyers fortunate enough to be involved in the case that ended up before the U.S. Supreme Court. However, our involvement with marriage equality did not start in the courtroom, rather it began in our church. Tell me about that. Go ahead, Bill. So, uh you know, our church has always been a liberal, I think, progressive, forward-thinking church. And uh, this issue of uh, marriage, marriage equality, has really been bubbling up since the 1990s and before even. So it's become such an important issue. And uh, I think the people in our church, and Phil was one of the big leaders in our church, uh, realized it was an important issue. So it started there before we were involved in the lawsuit. And in at Belmont, and, and I think it was around 2007 that it really, as far as looking at sexuality in the church and within the United Methodist Church, that's really kind of when it started, I think, to, to come right. to the forefront. That's really right. And then from there, Belmont has kind of become a leader in one of the things I know is reconciling ministries. Right. Uh, there's now 865 congregations in the United Methodist Church that are reconciling ministries. Belmont is one of those. Yes. And you, I think, maybe even refer to it in a different way. We so call it Belmonters for Inclusion. Inclusion, yeah. 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 So how has that helped move the message along in the church? Well, again, I, I think it all comes down within the church to knowing people, knowing their stories, understanding one another. You know, uh, I had never been part of officiating a wedding. The only wedding I ever officiated was two uh, same-sex members of, of our congregation. And, you know, the, the power of that uh, displayed over, you know, a, a whole congregation is, is where I really see the, the, the need for, for, for movement. Well, and just so uh, for viewers who may not be familiar, but the United Methodist Church is going through uh, a huge situation right now, and there's going to be a special general conference. They normally meet every four years. They're going to be right. meeting next year about the issue of human sexuality, because I want to quote this, and I grew up Methodist, so right. my heart is, and I work for Methodist Communications. I, I have a huge heart for the Methodist Church, but these, in the Book of Discipline, the qualifications 
for ordination. This is what it says. While persons set apart by the church for ordained ministry are, subject, are subject to all the frailties of the human condition and the pressures of society, they are required to maintain the high standards of holy living in the world. The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. That's, that was that, written in 1972-ish. That sentence and, is incompatible with Christian teaching. I agree. And that was added. That was not there for, for decades. And, and that came, that language was added over time, beginning in the, in the late 70s and into the 80s. And it, 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 I think it's going to be a, a black mark on the, the history of this church. I think you'll find that at, at Belmont, that's not an accepted part of Christian dogma. So it well, is in the book of discipline. We understand that. Absolutely. And, and as I always say, I'm like, how would you feel if I said, are you a self-avowed practicing heterosexual? Right. That is the most it's, insulting it's, thing. It is. On so many levels. We yeah. agree. We and, agree. So uh, the thing is, though, how do you feel the, and I know a lot of people are very progressive on this issue in the Methodist Church. I have a lot right. of friends that are, right. but there are others that are not. Right. Um, how are they, what do you think is going to happen at General Conference? Uh, we've got about a minute left, and that's coming up, like I said, next, next spring. So I think it's hard to predict what's going to happen. We know it's a, we know it's a big issue, and that people are passionate about it. I don't think Phil or I, either one, really understand why it is such a divisive issue, but it is, and uh, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I, I have hope. I have hope that the language will be removed, and and but I think it's more than just removing the language, right? I mean, if you're going to be an inclusive place, you can't just accept people, you need to celebrate people. And I, and I think that is really where the church needs to go, is to celebration, not just acceptance. All right, well said. The book is incredible. I want to make sure people get this. There's the information right there on your screen. The Fight for Marriage, it's available at Parnassus Books right here in Nashville and wherever fine books are sold. It is an amazing read. I can't urge you enough to get that. So make sure that you do. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, stay tuned. Pam is coming up next. Emily Rendleman from the APSU Gay Straight Alliance joins her. You're watching Out and About Today.